Well, hey, boys and girls, our guest today is David Livingston. David is an interior and architectural photographer. He's here in town to take pictures of our spec house. And we sit down with him, with my dad, also for a few minutes. We talk about photography. We talk about his how he got to this uh, industry. And, and he's really had a whole career. In fact, you've got to go to his website and see the stuff he's done. It's unbelievable. Beautiful. He has seen real estate and construction and this industry from a, a totally different point of view than most people. And we talk about photography. We talk about that thin line between art and craft. It's really interesting. He's a really thoughtful and insightful guy. Very happy to have met him. Very grateful he came up to take our pictures. Cannot wait for you to see those pictures. I myself as well. I can't wait to see them. And I hope you enjoy this discussion with David Livingston. So you've been in the industry throughout this most insane change, it seems like, from film and old school. Mm -hmm. And the transition's completely over, seeing both sides go. So could you just give us the story of how you got into the industry and photography? And then later, I want to really talk about what that was like in those years when it was changing really quickly. Right. And maybe since, I know I know there's, there's still changes, but how did it all kind of start off the bat for right. you? I think, you know, I, I was a retired ski bum. And so I knew I couldn't keep being a waiter and living in the in the Sierras, and I wanted to do something, but I didn't know what that something was. And I ran into a, a woman, and she introduced me to a photographer for Architectural Digest. So back in the day, that was mm. the publication for, for this type of uh, photographing home and design and, and somewhat architecture. So I'm... I got hired by him to run around and do some errands wow. and then got fired by him two months later mm -hmm. and he hired his nephew. Nope, no problem hiring your nephew, but I learned a few lessons quickly about nepotism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, In other words, uh, you, you didn't mess up. He right. just had a nephew. He just had the, another. You know, <laughs> one job and one nephew. There you go. So in that kind of uh, hutsmanship, uh, how do you say that word? Um that courage to I can do this. Yeah, I I took that little piece of information, and I realized that there was a new um, store that rented professional uh, photo equipment that had moved from Los Angeles to San Francisco. So I knew they had a whole building full of equipment and no clients yet. In other words, well, you not owning the equipment was no barrier because you were now able to rent the camera. Well, and and, and you had had a dark room in eighth grade. I had so, a dark so room in eighth cameras grade. cameras were your native. And my first um, purchase from my newspaper route money was a professional camera in eighth grade. Wow. So, uh, so I thought, oh, you know, I think maybe I, I can try to do this. And I was uh, pounding nails, doing light construction during the day. And then... On the days off, I'd put a suit and a tie on and show up my portfolio. But how I got that portfolio was I went to this uh, store and I said, I have $1,000 and I have a month. I, how about this? You set me up with the gear and I will make my portfolio. And then I cold called lots of architects and designers and say, I'll, I'll shoot for free. And if you like the photo, you can buy the photo for $50. Now, this is 1986. $50 probably was a fair amount of money. Yeah. So, so let me, how did you arrive at the number of $50 for a photo? How, how did you inform yourself of market prices? Because uh, that's always the problem in construction. Yeah, I guess, I guess from the rental house, I could. they were um, they were my Reddit, as it were, oh, right? Yeah. You know, I mean, that's where, you, where your vendors were. Would, would, you know, if they could take you under their wing and say... Yeah. You know, other guys do it this way, or you might try this. Or I went to the lab that processed my film, and they say, you know, you should you should adjust your exposure a little like this. Mm. And so it was this this group of just giving shopkeepers mm -hmm. that that provide me that information. Slick. Um, wow. San Francisco is also a little unique. It was where I'm from, and that area is that because it's a peninsula. And there's East Bay and South Bay and and Marin and North Bay. You don't come. You don't always have to come 
competing with each other. Mm. So it's a community that can be a little nurturing in it in that sense, mm. uh, because I won't come up against you, you know, maybe once every two years. So mm. you and I can share information. Wow. Yeah. Sorry about derailing your story. So you, you decided that you would shoot for free for these architects. You cold call them, you were dressed up, right. you had a growing portfolio. Yep. Give, me a, give me a shot. Yeah, exactly. And I made $3,000 in my first month, which wow, that broke, felt great. Which broke even because the, the film and, and the Polaroids and all that was, was expensive too. Okay. It's, it was in its day a field that you had to have the gear to do the work. Uh -huh. But you couldn't get the gear because it was too expensive to get the work. Yeah. So there was a real trap for most people. And yeah. most most photographers would come up through a, a traditional apprentice program mm -hmm. and run around and do uh, you know the lackey stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and so after the, my first month, I think uh, I did carpentry work for another two two weeks two months mm -hmm. at most because i i couldn't be clean and dirty it's not yeah, the same sure. day right mm -hmm. yeah um so, so did, at what point maybe when you were working for the the guy who hired you did you kind of transition your mind like okay this is gonna work i'm not gonna need to go back to the ski resort i'm gonna this is there's something here for me or was because for a lot of people it takes years to kind of settle into a career but right you kind of have described it relatively quickly it seems like and it, were you pretty much committed like i'm gonna i'm gonna really uh, dial this in let's see there was a there was a monetary factor that was highly motivating because mm -hmm. most of my friends had gotten advanced degrees i had a you know a degree from a, a bachelor's degree but i had been skiing for four years so i had set a mark of age 30 two years after i started to being able to buy a home Mm -hmm. And so I busted my butt. Yeah. And my friends were doing, you know, sales jobs and they were selling photocopiers or whatever it might be. And they would tell me the process on sales where you, you build a farm and a network mm -hmm. and you keep hitting them again and, and, you know, give it time and it will pay off. And so I kind of treated it as a sales job for the first year. Um, as I was developing my skill, I had kind of sales skills and interpersonal skills that I had. I was a waiter mm -hmm. uh, uh, in Lake Tahoe, and so those things transfer there. So I, I like to say a biography is best uh, written in reverse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, but all those little micro steps that mm -hmm. come to take you on your path mm -hmm. in the in that moment, you don't quite know. You have no idea what's really happening. Mm -hmm. Last uh, on Friday, I was photographing in a, a new high-rise in San Francisco that was right next to the, the Merchant Marines hiring hall. Mm. And in 1978, I was in that lobby, in that hiring hall, and I had, had an hour to decide if I wanted to join and go work on a cruise ship. Wow. Or go back to school. Wow. wow. You're so, kind of looking at it. Irony. Saying, like, I've been in there right? before. <laughs> and Circular. So, and so now I'm, you know, in a brand new building looking across from this and thinking, wow, 30 years and this is yeah. kind of where it's come wow. around. So. I remember when I was young, um, let's say that age, and I would hear stories like this of older fellas who had started their career and were knocking doors or beating the streets. And I remember it sounding like in those days you could do that. Right. But kind of, and I, this, for me, this is in like 2003, probably when I was at that age. And I remember thinking even then, like, the world's a little different now. I don't think that would quite work. Do you think that's the case, or do you do you think kids are hustling that way? Can could someone hustle up a a photography career kind of in that yeah, way? Yeah, more so now because the the barrier of entry for um, the cost of the the equipment is you know, a tenth of the price. Plus, because of YouTube and the the openness of the internet, just about any skill can be learned. Yeah, and that's before, the truth. It was really, I had to buy the Polaroid to develop the skill, yeah. and that cost was a thousand dollars a month in Polaroid. Gee, and so that's a lot. That's so a you lot. had to be working to get that skill. Yeah, and probably every time you squeezed off a shot too, you're like, I hope that was a good one. Well, it cost the money every time. Yeah, right? <laughs> I mean, it was like it was a dollar a piece, and I <laughs> and I would give myself a budget of, of three pieces of Polaroid to 
to you know dial in the lighting and the the lighting was complicated it was the strobe lighting that would flash for a millisecond yeah. and you had to balance that out without a lot of fa false shadows wow um and that's technology has changed all that so we don't have to have that gear so a couple things are, are intriguing to me a ski bum so I, I had heard you talk about in fact you and your boy mentioned the Sierras a couple times and Tahoe a couple times right. in conjunction with fires and stuff. And I could I could just kind of recognize that Tahoe had significance to you and him yes. in, in the way yeah. you were saying that. Yeah. So Here's so you a, spent a lot of time skiing up around in, in those in that Tahoe bowl. There's right. a lot of ski resorts yep. up there, yep. right? Up in there. Okay. So give us a ski story. Did you ever <laughs> really did you ever break any bones? Did you pull people out with broken uh, bones? Let's see. Give us, give it, why did you love skiing? But I mean what tell us about the ski at chapter. Let's see. I, I even though I lived there for four winters, I I would only ski maybe 10, 10 14 days a year. So okay. I wasn't a, I've never been a diehard athletic type. Mm -hmm. So I like the, the 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 closest of nature or I like just the you know, the poetry and motion, they called it, of the kind of French perfect slalom thing. Just the I, energy of the towns under those mountains. Well, yeah. no, let's see. I felt it was a very transient town because I was transient. Uh -huh. I think if you're a transient, then the town is transient. And if you want to be part of a community, then it's no longer. It's a different on your outlook. Uh -huh. Because after my fourth winter, I started seeing the same people. And I thought, oh, I know people in this town. Yeah. What made you think that you were either that you were interested in stepping from producing this kind of work at the end of the day to producing this kind of work at the end? The money, I mean, money's yeah. a thing. Um, you know, I very consciously thought about the amount of time one can be creative and the amount of time one needs to do the administrative part or just the the nuts and bolts of whatever your field is, and I broke it down by industries like if i thought as a photographer while you're there with the camera my mind is creatively engaged the entire time mm. if i'm an architect and the architects that are my clients they say maybe about 30 percent of their time mm. they are coming up with design solutions imagining the possibilities and the rest is making beautiful drawings that get stamped mm -hmm. um and so that along with at the time it was it was a well paid um I, I you know for you when i came up to want to shoot this i consider myself a trade mm -hmm. i i apply very you know specific things as gained over multiple years mm -hmm. and knowledge about complicated connections mm -hmm. and things so um uh, there is a photography part that's more artistry and I consider myself more of the craft mm -hmm. of photography yep. mm -hmm. with the intellect of the composition that forms what I consider the story or the narrative of what I'm taking. Mm. Um, I th one of the, I think, influences in my life have been uh, a few people, and there have been people that have chosen a unique path mm -hmm. and a path that wasn't given. Uh, one friend is a chef of, uh, and he's up at Lake Tahoe. He went to J Japan to study ceramics, Japanese ceramics. And he lived in a temple. He was from Buffalo, New York. Uh, and he learned Japanese. And he was kind of adopted for a year by this Japanese family. But each bowl or vessel or plate that they made had a special type of food that would go in it. So you'd have your scrambled egg bowl and you'd have your, you know, mac and cheese bowl or whatever it might be. He came back to to America and became a chef. A chef. Now, the step between making a vessel and making dinner is still craft. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the the intellect to organize a staff of 30 people in a restaurant you own and be a plumber in the morning and you know greeting your best customers at night is kind of how we need to survive on these multiple levels. As a contractor, mm -hmm. you need to have the pre people skills mm -hmm. to read the people you're working for, decide which subs to work with. Mm -hmm. um, so he was very inspirational. He didn't. He knew nothing about kind of my interests of design and architecture, furniture. So I actually had to teach him 
the current trends and my interests so we could have a conversation about what mm. I was interested in. Mm -hmm. Like if I was hanging out with you, Scott, I would learn up on blacksmithing. Right. So I would say, gee, you know, is this Damascus steel really the thing or should we, you know, right. move on to the next thing mm -hmm. or whatever it might be, sure. right? I mean, sure. there's, there's going to be cycles of, of, of uh, our arts. And so yeah, I had two other friends. One, uh, he was... Uh, I grew up with high school. He was brewing his own beer in eighth grade. He parked his Ducati motorcycle in his living room. <laughs> he, when I would visit him, he would say, well, I, I'm going surfing tomorrow. I said, well, I thought you could wrench on my car. And he says, huh, going surfing tomorrow. <laughs> he became a mechanic for Maseratis for a very certain time period, and you have to book him months in advance to work on your transmission. Ah, wow. A specialized, you know. Ah. Uh, another one is a, a, a conductor, and he started a, the Moab, Moab Music Festival. Uh -huh. uh, so I had a few friends that found their own unique path and I think nowadays people are able to look outside the given to other opportunities. Mm -hmm. I mean, you guys are examples of that, certainly. But in 1980... Harder. Very much harder. You were supposed to go put on yeah. a suit and get a job and go work for a company. You yeah. know, I was... that. Jim Lawson that I rode off in his Ferrari yesterday from the job. Oh, you weren't there at the time. But he owns the lot that just below the house. Okay, now he bought it from David Brockett. Jim's a great guy. And I went to look at another pro piece of property he's looking at. And he has some nice older cars. And uh, we, we were getting acquainted. And he said that he had a friend who, when he, when he became a man and took on a man's responsibility, he made a deliberate decision to change his career every 10 years. Huh that he would last 10 right. years in any given field, then he was going to change. Yeah. And Jim went through the list of things that that guy did. And I just thought, wow, what would that do to your horizons? Mm -hmm. You know, to become 10 years competent mm -hmm. and either succeed or fail over, you know, what, maybe five times in your life. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that's kind of what you're describing in these different guys' lives. Yeah, well, they've all stayed with it. Mm -hmm. It's all, um, so it's, it's interesting. They're all... Um, you know, creative people, I, I'm not in touch with them that much, but they, they were important at different times for me just mm -hmm. to know that that possibility is out there. One thing that tradesmen and craftsmen can do who've done it for a long time, the routine stuff, you know, a lot of people can kind of do, um, but when those kind of weird things come that the guy has seen oh, I, before, it's that's part of what you get when you hire a pro. Like, you're not going to surprise them or stump right. them. Yeah. They'll figure yeah. it out versus yeah. like a homeowner who's going to run into something and just stall out yeah. point my question is um can you describe some parts in your career where maybe interesting photography dilemmas that you kind of had to solve that don't come up every day that are challenging that now I, in other words i'm sure you could walk into any house like ours for example and you kind of knew before you rolled up the hill that this is going to be a light snack there's nothing that can stump me or or are there houses that you're kind of like whoo i don't know we gotta do this differently does that exist yeah, well, in you know photography I'll answer that in, in the second part, but the first part, people say, what is my favorite photo? Yeah. Or, or what what do I like to shoot the most? And there's an element of serendipity that happens in photography, and it's where I can position the camera where I would like to with the lens that I would like to have, and the light comes together, and the elements of the home, because that's what I'm photographing, homes, is there, and it comes into a perfect composition. Most of the time, that doesn't happen. Hmm. Ninety percent of the time, that doesn't happen. Hmm. So I, I'm always kind of up. There's a problem, and I'm trying to come up with the most elegant solution, mm -hmm. or the solution that feels most natural. That's how I define the scope of my look. Other people would say, you know, I don't care about that. I want to make it kind of look crazy and wild or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I think as I've gone along. I remember there was a all black granite bathroom with a wall to wall mirror and all these lights and a door and all I could see myself was myself in the <laughs> in the mirror with all these reflected light spots <laughs> and your camera and my camera and I told my client I says I sorry I can't photograph this now I just go ahead and photograph it 
have myself removed in Photoshop, oh. have all those lights changed, yeah. uh, adjust everything, and spend 20 minutes photographing it, 10 minutes photographing it, and somebody spends an hour in Photoshop cleaning it cleaning up. So it up. that's been the, the huge change in the little things that I used to do to just to get rid of a, a cord, mm. taping it and things like that, and the time that that would take. Got it. I just stepped past all of that. Interesting. Wow. Um, and so in this year, after over 30 years of doing this, I produce photos that, A, I couldn't have done before, and B, have never been better. Wow. That so, feels good. You 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 don't expect that at the, to most, happen. Most of us at the end of our ride, right. we, we deteriorate both in output and quality. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And so it's it's really the it's the technology that's made this change. Hmm. And so, then me and the other photographers that have been plying along with me and my generation of photographers, we've all had to make that switch too. Hmm. What was that like when the you know you first got wind of these digital cameras and I'm sure guys scoffed and they're like that's a toy and then what was that like over that like I don't know was it five years where just things were changing quickly and then t everybody just is like well it looks like we're all going digital now or can you describe those years yeah. probably the late 90s or whenever it was yeah so uh, let's put it at the year of uh, 1999. There were digital cameras before, and they were like you say, a toy or, or something kind of simple. Um, but what happened in 1999 is the professional digital cameras got to a level that they could be submitted to any magazine, mm -hmm. and their art directors would say, nice image. They wouldn't have any negative connotations from mm -hmm. the quality. Um, but that price point came at $60,000 for the camera. Mm -hmm. oh. In and 1999. Yeah, nineteen ninety nine. You can buy a house for sixty thousand dollars. And so enough do. of us professional photographers were able to step up. Some people took loans. Um, that Kodak went bankrupt the following year because because we weren't buying film. We professional photographers. Within one year of that professional digital camera, more or less yeah. coming out, Kodak, Kodak was dead. Yeah, tapped out. Wow. And there are some some number of people mm. listening to this for whom Kodak is a word like what. Um, chuck wagon right okay yeah almost meaningless they have a vague understanding <laughs> okay, right. that it had something to right, do with right. with photographs yeah. and kodak yeah. ruled they were yeah. they were a giant they were the world you know number one film producer i'm sure wow do you remember like, like skeptics you know like the older dudes professionals then kind of like oh i can never i'll i'm sure do no, were people I think, like skeptical of it or, or uh, maybe photography is used to technology getting better and better just by nature of the film cameras themselves that it wasn't that hard to yeah i don't know if the the they were sepsis it was we were all kind of, no one enjoyed going back and forth to the lab every day mm. drop your film off picking it. it up two hours later oh that answers it yeah the right? professionals it like made so, their life so much so easier. now it was we the, didn't have to do that anymore yeah okay. worth and, 60 grand i'll yeah. take it right and so if I'm charging my clients fifty dollars for film and Polaroid, I charge them fifty dollars to use my digital camera, yeah. and it paid for itself. Yeah. So once again, you had to be working at a at a good clip, yeah, to be able to pay for the gear. Yeah. Wow. And now, you know, a thousand dollars and a laptop, yeah, you're, you're able to get some nice images out there. Wow. The other thing about photography that we haven't mentioned, but should be in the in San Francisco or anywhere in the '80s and '90s, you kind of had to sell take your pictures and sell them to the local people. But the fact that you can deliver goods across, you know, the internet now, for example, oh, someone yeah. could hire someone from New York, be like, hey, I need some pictures of the Golden Gate Bridge for da da da. They get in touch with you or, and then they're delivered. That, that wasn't right. happening no, to the same no, extent. No, it was so. still, we had to burn our digital photos onto CDs and yeah. put them in a mail and do all that. So that was well, part of it. Huh? Um, okay. So a, a more, uh, subjective or esoteric yeah. esoteric no subjective so blacksmithing there's a term that that is appropriated by lots of us who do this anachronism of blacksmithing making things that you can buy for a tenth of the money right yeah. that may not you know what i'm saying and that is artist blacksmith and it's it, for most of us it's a presumption to have artists put in front of blacksmith. It is for me. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there's this line you talked about between art and craft, and it's a right. thin, blurry line. And some blacksmiths are strong enough on the art side that you can't. That's obvious. There's a guy named Tom Joyce, 
man, artist blacksmith, any way you want to slice him. And then there's a lot of other guys that aren't, even though the things that they, we make are, are beautiful and sometimes have elements of art. This is a long preamble. I have heard that the difference between an artist and an artisan is that an artist, an artisan signs the back of the piece and an artist signs the front. <laughs> okay, so talk for just a second about this thin blurry line between art and craft and the right. confidence that it takes to term or consider oneself an artist or whether, or whether that is just, is that a mind game that nobody needs to play anymore? And I mean, some people make a lot of money because they have the chutzpah to position themselves as artists and right. the marketing skills to make some number of other people believe it. Right. And some number make of people make beautiful things and never consider themselves an artist, but nevertheless are producing art. Yes. Is that true in a phot photography? Um, yeah, I would imagine it is. I can't just come up with, with some names to kind of put in that situation. I think it's more how we're able to define ourselves. Mm -hmm. So for, for me, I've been told I'm an artist. Mm -hmm. I've done, I've made things for most of my life. Mm -hmm. It's really hard for me to say that I'm an artist. Mm -hmm. And I think if more people gave them permission mm -hmm. to be an artist, and then also recognizing that for a lot of artistry, there has to have a sound craft mm -hmm. supporting it. Mm -hmm. They they can go to different places than they would have by not giving themselves permission to be the artist. That's a great mm -hmm. answer. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of your audience that probably could resonate from this. We don't say, oh, you're going to grow up and be a great artist. You're going to grow up and be a great ball player or successful businessman mm -hmm. or you're gonna you know go to the stock car races and knock it out you know so i think it's giving ourselves those permission and those touchstones people in my life were those people that were doing art they didn't climb on the top of the mountain and say i'm an artist mm -hmm. but they are known for their mm -hmm. craft and artistry yeah yeah so, yeah, I, I don't find that term artist super helpful because mm -hmm. it's so vague and and I feel like the the def important uh, aspect that some artists or trades and craftsmen are paid mm -hmm. is totally left outside. And so, for example, artists who make a living from their art um, might be called a photographer who's had a career yeah. in it or whatever. And so they would say, "I'm a architectural mm -hmm. photographer or whatever." And that artist thing to me, there's like an implication almost of someone who is being subsidized yeah, or right, yeah. doesn't work yeah. or it seems you derogatory. It's, it's honestly seems derogatory. Yeah. And, and I, and the, my other anecdote, and I just learned this, I think it's Albert Bierstadt, the mm -hmm. painter. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, like one of the most famous, uh, landscape painters right. of the last hundred years, yeah. maybe 1880s, 1870s, something like that American was West, a, yeah. apparently yeah. absolute master marketer. And when he would unveil a painting, it was this huge, Deal. Event, Cr right. event, mm -hmm. crowds, mm -hmm. right. flyers, mm -hmm. marketing, yeah. selling, uh, hype. Mm -hmm. And so nobody would claim he wasn't an artist, mm -hmm. but that component of his career where he was marketing and selling and The little P.T. Barnum in there. Yeah, yeah exactly. P.T. Barnum. <laughs> right. yeah. And so in terms of blacksmithing artists, I, at least for me, that is almost like eh, artist. Anyways, yeah. I'm making, I'm blacksmithing and I'm making a living yeah. at it or right. photography, taking pictures, you know? I think, so, I look at this intersection a lot and I was in uh, Italy and Venice and Murano, the island of the glass blowers in June. I spent four hours on that island talking to the shops in a time when there were no tourists, so they had time to talk to me. Yeah. Um, I've always had ideas about doing light fixtures. And so I was kind of seeing those those multi-generational families having these little shops, making kind of the same stuff in a, that kind of meets a, a mass market appeal of something that can cost $40. Um, but their skill sets are so deep, they could produce, you know, incredible things. Anything. Yeah. And that's the mastery of the uh, of the guild mm -hmm. 
Yeah. But then those skills oftentimes worked with somebody that had the artistic because mm. you need to have the two mm -hmm. to really do phenomenal That's things. right. Yeah. That's right. So, and so it's rare that somebody can have the craft and the artistry at an exceptional level in the same body. That's mm -hmm. right. And then if you add the, the marketing skills, if you right. add a little bit of P.T. Barnum, right. bam. Yeah. You've got, so another fellow that I, was, that I am superficially acquainted with, he helped me a little bit one time. He's up in the Seattle area. Steve Lopes is his name. I don't know if Steve's still working up there. But he had a working blacksmith shop, five or six guys working. It's a bigger market in Seattle. And the man is an artist. I mean, he has that. The, the things that come out of his shop, I see him in coffee table books. It's like, how do you think those thoughts? Right. And then how do you produce that that beauty? Mm -hmm. But he is unabashedly not, he said, yeah, you can call me an artist if you want, but I'm a blacksmith. Right. Okay. And he's, he's, not, he's not being condescending or patronizing when he says that. He's just laying it out there. Call me what you want. It doesn't matter. I'm a blacksmith. Yeah. You know, that's a healthy attitude, yeah. especially when you can produce the work. I was I was watching an hour long video of a an Italian master glass blower who must be in his eighties, a guy named Lino, and Lino's now he was the one that came to Seattle and helped inform the whole Pilchuck school with the old world techniques because mm -hmm. they wanted them to stay in Murano. They didn't want their guys going around the yeah. world teaching mm -hmm. a bunch of Americans how to do uh, yeah, and it that kind of opened up what we call studio glass and studio glass and, and studio blacksmithing and sculpting, uh -huh. you know, is, is in their plastic mediums. They have a lot yeah. of heat. Um, but so watching this man create these blown vessels with the support of four or five people on his team, mm. uh, is just amazing. But then when you hear his words, his words are so Italian to me. It's like you you, you feel the glass. You yeah. obviously can't feel the glass. Mm -hmm. You know, you see it. You you know, it's like when when we're baking something in the oven, I said, Luca, do you can smell that? This is my son who's ten. It's ready, it's done. Go go get those cookies out of the oven. Mm -hmm. You know, because uh -huh. we have to use all our senses. Mm -hmm. Like when you were stamping that nail. Mm -hmm. You know what color is that mm -hmm. iron, mm -hmm. and at that moment, and then it's you know at what color do you stop? Mm -hmm. You know you just got to mm -hmm. move on to the other one. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I think all these things is, and where do as individuals we find? I don't think any one person is all one or the other. All right. It's what that mix is for each of us, and how we are able to put that mix together in a successful life, career, mm -hmm. and and. Your families and relationships that come mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. When you worked for that fellow, you know, the first guy, you probably right. learned a lot of things in just a couple of months or however long it was, maybe it's a couple of years, I can't remember, before he hired his nephew. Right. Um, and I'm thinking about you, you also probably knew quite a bit about photography before that. So, what kind of things did you learn from being around this? Let's call him a master. You know, he was right. doing that, that, that were, that was, I'm, I'm guessing, really helpful, even though it was kind of a short, Internship or um, job or whatever. Uh, actually, it's let's see. I think photography is such an internal thing that as he was creating his compositions, I didn't know what he was thinking about. Yeah. Oh, you were just like, go, and go I was get just, my tripod, you know, yeah, go get, get me a new get battery. That camera case, yeah. Got yeah, it. I need some film. Got it. And so I only learned that it didn't seem that intimidating. Interesting. That, you know, I, I think... <laughs> If you make a nail as your first thing in blacksmith, huh. you know that you got to get it hot and you need to bash it up. You start in. And you do it again and you do it again and you make 10 nails and the last one's going to look better than the first one. Yes. And then maybe you think, well, I can do something else. I see my, my son challenges himself. He's, Papa, I'm challenging myself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? And... Um, I, I let them, so, you know, hopefully I don't have to go to the hospital too many, yeah. too many times. But, yeah, you know. I, I, there's some trades like that. I remember the first time I hired an AC guy to fix a broken air conditioner. And in Arizona and in this house, the air conditioner was in the attic. And it's right. very mysterious. You're like miserable. The house is thing. And the guy like gets up in there and he comes back out and it's like magic. You know, he's like, yeah. fix this thing. And I he don't wasn't. Know what he did. Yeah. yeah and, it, and it really felt like at the time, like, wow, what a miracle. Anyways. The next time I crawled up there with the guy and I was kind of like, oh, he was just like cleaning off the little evaporator and like <laughs> it was not, it was, in other words, there was no magic right. and I'm not like I'm an AC guy, but I remember thinking like, 
I used to really think these air conditioners, when he took the thing right. off and there was like all these wires that were just like burned. And I was like, well, that wasn't that hard to troubleshoot. It's right. that <laughs> well, little that one capacitor. doesn't look like the others. Yeah. So sometimes <laughs> yeah. just kind of being, you, you got to be in the job site or get hired or be around yeah. it. But sometimes just sort of seeing, oh, this maybe isn't as magic or maybe for a more artistic thing like that. Like you said, like he's setting up, you're like, oh, this I could probably do it could be that we're also have over the past couple decades just have gone through a phase where the trades weren't appreciated Mm -hmm. and that we you know are coming through if we come through that and we know that we need to provide these opportunities we need to create these programs or have uh, you know schools that that have auto shops or Mm -hmm. things like that not everyone's going to be a computer uh a coder or something like that. Uh, in my high school, we had a linotype machine mm-hmm. and offset, you know, hand press. What I don't know, even know what that is. Linotype are it's a about as large as a big Yukon. It's oh. a machine that sets rows of letters as a, a type. Oh. That becomes your line within a newspaper. So every in old timey newspapers, every line was a slug of lead. Oh, wow. That was typed and then put into a rack, and then the paper was printed over on that. Wow. And so we were making those slugs. Wow, that is old. Ninth grade. So I think just being able to see the material of one thing to another when I'm – when I'm kneading dough to make some bread and I'm looking at ceramics and I think it's yeah. all, so many things come together. Yeah. But I think we, we isolate them and make them complicated or don't think that we could do it. And um, now you can. Yeah. You, you know, that, that that's obviously what, what our, something our channel's tapped into because nothing that I do is that remarkable. Nothing. Yeah. It's all mundane, blue collar, run of the mill work. But we've gotten so um, distant from whatever process it is that brings to us what it is that we have to have to live. I think there's some sort of an uncertainty about, wow, what would I do if I couldn't just go pick this off the shelf at Home Depot? Or at least that mystery, you know, the AC man goes up and does that work and it's a mystery. And the same thing with, I don't know, pick whatever it is that used to be anybody's dad could do it. Right. And everybody's dad did it. And now not only does nobody's dad do it, but you don't know of anybody in your neighborhood that can do it. Right. And so therefore there's an interest in these things. Yeah. It, we were talking about the demographics of the people that are watching our, our videos and they are those people there. The, Nate's a poster child right. for the people that are watching the videos. Mm-hmm. And we yeah. get these comments all the time that, wow, I wish I would have learned that. And so maybe there really is a trades gap. Maybe Mike Rao is right. Row, uh, sorry, Mike. Well, I think Mike Rowe is right that there's a tr- shortage here now. Right, right. I th- there, when you when we were growing up, we went to Sears Roebuck and we bought Craftsman tools mm-hmm. because they were guaranteed for life. That's right. And they and we put up the money for them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then as we got more into the 70s and 80s, and and manufacturing goods got offshored, mm-hmm. and we all benefited because everything was half the price. Mm-hmm. In the, in the beginning, it was less than half the quality, mm-hmm, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. But th- the price of individual things has gotten so skewed from what the labors of our own body mm-hmm. can do. Big time. And so then that kind of kills any feeder channel mm-hmm. to, to building a, a craft society. Yep, mm-hmm. yep. Doesn't uh, make any sense. Right, yeah, but... In, in affluent suburbs where I am in the San, uh, San Francisco area, they have these maker fairs. Mm-hmm. And there's a huge desire to make stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, but they're making them out of Lego parts and servo motors and things like 3D that. 3D printing. 3D printing, right. Um, but a friend of mine did the uh, the bots, the uh, that bot TV show. Oh, the destruction. The bot. old one where they like battle in the yeah, ring. Yeah, battle wow. bots. Cool. Battle bot. Yeah, cool. Um, and he has a machine shop, a six man machine shop. Um, but he's a tinkerer, mm-hmm. and he grew up around tinkerers, mm-hmm. and he and he w- inherited the the welding shop in Sausalito. Mm. Um, 
but he comes from that lineage mm -hmm. of of that. But very few times do we see it. Yeah. Uh, but I think the uh, getting back to your as we do make things and the people that are on your channel, it's a pride of ownership of my own labors. Yeah, it is right? that. Having yeah. some real skin in a game. Right, yeah. Yep. Where I might so. cut myself making this. You <laughs> yeah, know, I really yeah. might. But, right? but that's okay because it'll give me something to <laughs> be a little proud of, you <laughs> right. know, next day at work. Yeah. There, there's a, there's a, a remarkable percentage of our viewers who are software engineers. Mm -hmm. Lots. Um, and other types of engineers as well. But there are plenty of people from the computer industry who right. write and comment. And then it's just, it's an interesting well, way. Well, I think that... Um, I haven't seen it, Lord of the Rings and the other one, that the TV drama. This kind of Middle Ages mm -hmm. type oh, of... Oh, Game of Thrones, probably. Game of Thrones. Yeah. Um, you know, that with with kind of a mix of the survivalists. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, you get this fantasy play yeah. and this survival and the uncertainty of the times, and mm -hmm. you throw it all together with some Coke. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and you bash it around and you make yeah. something. Yeah, that's right. You, so. you forge something. Um, yeah. what's it, what was it like? And maybe let's speak for a second. So you have this had this whole career on this part of const the construction industry right. yeah i mean you're the last guy in and looking through your website i haven't seen in your coffee table books but it's it's just almost amazing how many parts of this industry exist lots of them you don't even realize we occupy one of those parts right now ourselves kind of making an educational content part of it and we're like a microscopic right. part of the education part of the construction industry but What's that been like, sort of being attached You're with architects and engineers and designers? Mm -hmm. And um, did you think of yourself as kind of in the construction industry? Or is it, have you just always kind of been more like uh, you in the publishing right? industry? Yeah, the pub yeah. I, it feels to me that I'm in the, the f fashion moment. Oh. Because the projects that I photograph are ones that the architect and designer are very proud of to to go and photograph and take the expense and the time away from their practice. Uh, then that has a certain style that didn't probably happen three years ago. Uh -huh. And then in three years from now, it won't happen. So there's always been kind of a fashion curve on what I do. Interesting. And I can tell you by the tile pattern yeah. When a project was built, I'll bet you can. I can tell you by the the light fixture housing. Yeah, when a, you know, and so mm -hmm. these little elements that are, are changing every day uh, on a you know wide picture point of view. Yeah, those of us that are in it kind of notice those differences. Yep. As you're flipping through a magazine, you just say that looks that you know, looks nice. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. It's like when in the Devil Wears Prada where she's. Telling her like you're wearing that because it was on the clearance rack, <laughs> right? And we decided that five years ago, whatever however that yeah. went, it's a, maybe a little of it like that. But I I think for uh, one of the things as we came into Instagram and YouTube too, I was hoping for this amazing democratization of and plurality of style mm -hmm. and choices that people were able to do. And on Instagram, we don't see it as much as actually narrowed. Interesting. Uh, the aesthetic choices that people gravitate to. But I think in YouTube, you know, the more the merrier mm -hmm. uh, in that sense. So as I'm photographing today, what I'm seeing, and so I'll see things that, oh, I haven't seen that before, I, we need to photograph that. Or this is the wow. first time these things I've seen combined. And if I if I you know shoot a lot in, in my market, I, I'm kind of part of that arbitrator of that trend line. Wow. Yeah, you sure so are. Dig into that a little bit. On Instagram, the, everyone's kind of coalesced around a, a, a very common sort of style or what 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 exactly I is think, going on there? I think well with Instagram, the the more yeah, it changes all the time. It's it's not an even playing field. Uh, but the more people that like your your channel, the more likely it's going to go out to other people. Yeah. So the the strong just gets stronger. Yes. Uh, and then those that are strong kind of up their ante and their uh, uh -huh. their production value of what they're doing, and so they get even stronger. And huh. then. Instagram really just wants to hold your attention longer. Yeah. So the ones that maybe are the outliners, they're thinking, well, most people don't look at that, so we're not going to put that out there. 
Wow. So, and I think probably even in the in the what YouTube kind of throws up as your next things to what watch. What the algorithm right? thinks you want to see. Then you you kind of get, you know, as you break into a bubble and then become the bubble. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, you become kind of the player mm-hmm. in that yep, field. Yep, yeah. <laughs> and I don't think you woke up and said, I, this is my goal. Right. No. Right. You just, just kind of put up. one foot in front of the other and get one idea and thought, oh, okay, I guess we'll do that. It's the same yeah. as the choices that happen in the first part of a career. Mm-hmm. We have no idea that this person or that person or this job choice or that. Right. Co- we have no idea. We just do them because there's momentum in that direction and you look back yeah. and say, wow. Yeah. Well, sometimes when with my son, I, I give him a wide berth as to what he wants to do. And only a couple of times I said, you know, there's choices in life and some will affect your other choices in life. Yeah. I'll stand by you, whatever you want to do, but this is one of those moments. Mm-hmm. My dad was completely laissez-faire, so I didn't have that. So maybe I'm looking forward to being able to share that with my son. Wow. So wh- where should we direct the viewers to get a good look at some of your work? Where- I think uh, the, f- the first one would be my website, which is my full name, David Duncan. Livingston. Okay, we'll, we'll put a link up. Yeah. Okay, a link of that. And then my Instagram is David D. Livingston. Okay, we'll link to that also. Now, a little side note about Instagram for those that play it or not. I consider Instagram a huge time suck. <laughs> and if if at your the lowest bar that I think one might have is ten or twenty photographs of your best work. Uh-huh. That's all you need. Yeah. It's just a really quick way to show what you can do. Yeah. No one's going to go to, you know, meet me at a, you know, coffee shop and say, oh, what do you do? And I'll go to your website. Right. They'll say, what, you know, have an Instagram account. They whip out their phone. They look at it. We talk about it. Bam. Yep. So, but you don't have to post every day. (laughs) Yeah. It's like, it's almost the differentiating factor. Are you building an Instagram account because you want to have a big audience and influence right. it, or do you want to just use it as a tool for your business because your main yeah, I, event I call it, is... You know, <laughs> the, your, your, uh, I guess the... Uh, uh, your short portfolio. Yeah, yeah no, that's so. that makes perfect sense. Well, yeah. sounds good. And and obviously for the viewers, the probably the most interesting photos for you guys is going to be the pictures of the spec house. So that's right. we will, uh, when the time is right and when we have them, get them in front of you and whatever way seems the best. So you'll definitely get a look at the work. And I, if, if, I, if I didn't mention this in the intro, um, av- even just five minutes of watching you do your thing was, I've never done photography, but it was definitely kind of uh, not mind blowing, but wow, it's not, it's, there's, it's really neat. I, I heard you say a light bulb just went off. Yeah. It's like, it's like, I've never seen anybody take pictures of a house. I've taken it. I've done it maybe 75 times for a house that I bought and sold. No, nah, probably not that many, 40 or 50. And, I was not getting it, but point is, you're going to see the pictures and know what I mean. Well, thank you very much. I think one of my clients summed it up the most. Uh, they said that I'm a, a very intentional. Yeah. So if something's there, it's there for yes. some elements. And at the same time, it was like, it's also pretty simple. It wasn't like some, some you didn't walk in with this whole crew and lights and all this like right. commotion. It's very simple, very intentional. Yeah. And uh, can't wait to see him. One of the first things you said when we sat down here was pertaining to making things elegant, thinking of an elegant solution to a design dilemma. Mm. I, I love that. It's yeah. a, and it's the same no matter what craft right. you're working in, you're looking for the elegant solution. Yeah. That it is detailed enough to address every detail and simple enough to be able to do it and, and uh, buildable and repairable <laughs> and all of that. <laughs> all yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, thanks, David, for coming. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks for tuning in, everybody, and we will uh, catch you next time. Okay.